In our last video, I had begun to deal with four major features of human consciousness. I had noted that consciousness is limited, unitary, coordinated, and managerial, and I had described in some depth how consciousness is limited. So now I will proceed by describing how consciousness is unitary. Consciousness is unitary because each of us has only one sense of consciousness, and that consciousness tends to do one thing at a time. So we find it hard to multitask, and we have the same sort of problem with perception. For instance, if you look at the drawing, you can easily see it as either two faces or a vase, but you cannot easily view it as two faces and a vase simultaneously. What this suggests is that billions of neurons participating in consciousness at any given moment are acting together as a coherent unit. Something that tends to affirm this unity is the fact that certain kinds of brain surgery or brain damage can disrupt it. For example, if you divide the bridge of nerve tissue joining the two cerebral hemispheres, you will create two separate spheres of consciousness. There are still places where the two sides of the brain can communicate, but none that provide the sort of massive back-and-forth recurrent signaling that consciousness requires. Even so, once the two severed halves have gotten used to their predicament, they tend to become cooperative, and their two separate identities are hard to detect. They can be detected by careful experiments, such as those devised by a neuroscientist named Roger Sperry in the 1960s, work for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize. But in rare cases, no elegant experiments are needed because the two halves of a split brain are not conspiratorially cooperative, and the two halves disagree. So the right hand, controlled by the left brain, may try to eat while the left hand controlled by the right brain, blocks the fork. Or one hand may button up the patient's shirt while the other hand unbuttons it. The actions of this alien hand syndrome, as it is called, can seem quite comical if you are not the patient. But clearly it also provides a dramatic illustration of why you don't want the general management of your brain to be split and why you really do want consciousness to be unitary. This brings me to the third major feature of consciousness, which is coordination. It looks as though consciousness demands lots of coordination. That is, it's hard to see how all five senses, plus memory, emotions, thought, and procedural activity, could all be blended together seamlessly without lots of coordination. We know lots of coordination exists within the brain not only because of the way consciousness operates, but also because the EEG and other research tools routinely show billions of neurons firing together in a highly synchronized manner, both while we are awake and while we are asleep. And though we don't know precisely how this relates to consciousness, we have some compelling theories. One such theory advanced by the cognitive scientists Giulio Tinoni and Nobel laureate Gerald Edelman in the 1990s, asserts that all the neural circuits active in consciousness at any time are highly integrated with each other, so they all work together as a single system. This would explain the unitary nature of consciousness, and would also explain why the neurons participating in consciousness at any moment appear to oscillate at the same frequency. Supporting this theory, computer simulations have shown that such large-scale integration is feasible. That is, a computer can simulate neural circuits firing in a continuous, recurrent, and highly parallel fashion, and it has been found that such circuits can bind the activities of diverse specialized neuron groups, causing them to operate together as a single system. According to this theory, such dynamic integration requires continual stimulation. Neurons that do not get these ongoing recurrent parallel signals will stop taking part in consciousness. And conversely, signaling neurons can reach out to other neurons not contributing to consciousness and bring them in. 
In this way, the community of neurons participating in consciousness can shift and change from one moment to the next, permitting consciousness to involve whatever portions of the brain need to be involved. For instance, looking at an approaching horse would involve mostly visual circuits. But if the horse passed by and you tried to recite a limerick about a horse, visual involvement would diminish and the principal bound circuits would come to include ones dealing with memory and speech. So not only do we know that consciousness must by its very nature be highly varied in a well-coordinated manner, but we have some fairly good theoretical evidence suggesting how this happens. This brings us to our last major feature of consciousness, its managerial nature. Now looking at the human brain's basic anatomy, one wouldn't necessarily expect to find a general management system within it. That's because the brain is organized regionally, with different functions in different places, and brain impulses travel slowly. So bringing things together clearly involves a good deal of time and effort. Nevertheless, this sort of unity is needed for good management. Without it, administrative actions might be based on incomplete data, the range of options available might be restricted, and the resulting actions ordered up could suffer being less effective if not downright conflicting or contradictory. Recognizing consciousness as the brain's general manager helps to explain why our consciousness is so strongly oriented to the senses, especially the senses of sight and hearing. That's not to say that data involving memory, thought, and so forth are less important, but they tend to be handled on a longer time scale than sensory data, and while one may be lost in thought or consumed by some emotion, it's far more common to rivet one's attention on sensory events, anything from a flash of lightning to whatever happens to be on the television screen. You can reveal this sensory orientation by closing your eyes, blocking your ears, and noting the extent to which your sense of consciousness shrinks. Thought, emotion, and memory are still available, of course, but there is less to apply them to, and the potential for procedural motor acts has been cut because you cannot see the area of action. We can easily explain this marked sensory orientation if consciousness is the brain's general manager because the prime purpose of biological management is to cope with the outside world. In the human case, most information about the outside world comes in through the senses of sight and hearing. So it's only natural to suppose that consciousness, responding to the needs of general management, should concentrate heavily on sight and hearing. There's another way that seeing consciousness as the brain's general manager sheds light on the work that consciousness performs. For the common purpose of nearly all management systems is to take in more or less processed information, compare it to whatever other experience or information is at hand, and issue directives that keep things operating in a unified and coherent fashion. Within this context, it seems reasonable that the biological purpose of consciousness should be to create streams of useful, coherent information and send them throughout the brain so that they move back, forth, and around in a coordinated way. That's not to say that the mechanisms of consciousness dealing with, say, some object are providing all parts of the brain with the same information. Rather, it means that all parts of the brain dealing with this object are receiving coordinated, coherent, and consistent information. And so this information provides the entire brain with the ability to act in a unified and coherent fashion.